and our presenters will do their best to answer as many questions as time allows following the presentation. At this point, I'd like to introduce our speakers. First, we have Michelle Hanemichael, who is Solergo's founder, executive chairman, and chief strategy officer. Michelle sets the strategic direction for Solergo services, technology, and market expansion. Previously, Michelle was a founder of GPS Link and chief architect of the Virtual Relocation Management Model, a revolutionary web-based technology to help manage expatriate administration. Michelle is a frequent speaker on global payroll at the American Payroll Conferences and a contributor to GPMI, the Global Payroll Management Institute. Next joining us is Chris Jeffrey. Chris is a partner at Taylor Wessing in the IPIT group, and he heads the IT, telecoms, and competition groups in the UK. He specializes in advising technology companies on complex contractual negotiations, data protection governance, and compliance, as well as all areas of doing business online. His clients span the ad tech, financial tech, e-commerce, mobile, enterprise software, SaaS, and cloud, and high engineering sectors. For today's agenda, we're going to cover where we are with EU privacy, the international reach, we're going to go into a deeper dive of GDPR key components and GDPR essentials, and finally, we'll end up with next steps. So it is my pleasure to introduce Michelle and Chris. Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Kathy. That's great. Um, hello, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to, to join you today. Um, I always feel as a European privacy attorney, I should, I should apologize at the beginning of any GDPR presentation for, for what the Europeans are doing around privacy. Um, and first of all, what I wanted to do was just spend a little bit of time putting it into context and, and give you a bit of a grounding in where we fit with EU privacy generally and where GDPR fits in that broader picture. So perhaps we could move straight on to the three main areas um, which I see impacting, which we see impacting our, our clients. And, and the first there is data transfers, and many of you will be familiar with this already. It's, it's an issue we have under the current European Data Protection Directive. It's not driven by any of the developments we'll be talking about in this presentation. It's the issue around the way Europe tries to ring fence data um, and the flows of data and requires you to take some kind of measure, model clauses, privacy shield, if that personal data is going to leave Europe. And Michelle will talk in more detail around that issue in, in a few minutes' time. The proposed e-privacy regulation, that's just a very quick flag, I think, for this audience. It doesn't impact HR data specifically, but for those of you who are in the B2C space, I think the flag is we are also rewriting our rules. It impacts direct marketing to consumers. It impacts the use of cookies and other technologies online. So telcos and ISPs and e-commerce companies are worried about that. And that is coming down the line, expected to hit in May 2018, as is the GDPR. And that, if you like, that's the main event around EU privacy. Um, it's been coming down the line for a while but it's the, it's the rewrite of all of our privacy rules. So we've gone from being the high watermark of global privacy and not content with that in Europe. We, we've even legislated beyond that, as we'll see in a, in, in a bit more detail. <clears throat> At a high level, and you may have heard about this, the GDPR is getting attention for two main reasons. One is the size of the fine. So fines are up to 4% of global revenue. Um, which is, you know, putting it on a par with antitrust. And then secondly, where you have significant amounts of European personal data in your business, the, the compliance steps that the legislation requires um, are actually really quite extensive. And that's why we're hearing so much about it um, at, at the moment. Let's move on, if we may, to how we got here and, and, and how Europe has been messy in privacy um, for some while. Looking quickly at the existing directive, it goes back to 1995, and the, the key thing, you can sum 
sometimes look like Europe, but it's very aligned. It's a, it, it's a coherent body of people. They are privacy zealous, but everyone's broadly agreeing in Europe about what privacy means and therefore what compliance means. And in fact, as many as you may know, that's not the case at all. The differences between different European countries is stark. And therefore, what compliance means on the ground in practice for business is very different between different European countries. And very quickly, without, I don't want to get too much into the detail of the law, the reason for that is twofold. One, the existing law is a directive, and a directive is an instruction from the European Union institutions in Brussels to each of the 28 national governments in Europe saying, you guys, each of you, implement into your national law legislation which achieves these broad objectives. And everyone scurries off, and they do it often slightly differently. And so you end up already, you straight away, you've got a built-in patchwork and differences between the countries, which is not helpful to, to global business. Um, and let's look quickly. I've got a little graphic on, on how that tends to play out in practice. What I've done here, I've put the main European jurisdictions into this pyramid. Germany at the top, um, because really what Germany is, is the high watermark, even within Europe for this. So their regulators are the most bureaucratic and particular and the most thorough in their application of the rules. And then right down the bottom, UK, Ireland, and Netherlands, probably right as the three most pragmatic, business friendly of, of the main European jurisdiction. What you need to do as an employer on the ground in each of those countries is actually very different. Um, and, and, and that creates challenge. So let's have a, let's move on to the regulation itself and how that's going to change, um, uh, how that's going to change this patchwork picture. It's a regulation. The GDPR stands for the General Data Protection Regulation. And a regulation, unlike a directive, is actually national law the minute it gets passed by the EU institution. So there's no room for national parliaments to change much. The GDPR is what it is. It gets translated into French, into German, into Italian, etc. And it is, and it is the law. And Brussels have done that deliberately. They've looked at that pyramid and said, this really isn't what we were trying to achieve with the directive. We wanted the same rules everywhere. And so the regulation is intended to do that. Now, what businesses often ask at that stage is, okay, that's great, but where are we with the GDPR and the pyramid? And you might have hoped, certainly I did, that we would legislate down towards the more pragmatic, business-friendly approach that, that you see in the UK, Ireland, and the Netherlands. Sadly not. We're legislating up to that much more thorough Germanic approach and that's what the GDPR is. When my German colleagues read the first draft, they essentially said, this is the German approach to privacy. If anything, it's a little lighter than we're, than we're used to. And let's talk now, let's move on to timing, if, if we may, with that, with that brief background. And it may feel that in the marketplace, we've had an awful lot of noise around the GDPR in the last few months. In Europe, we've been looking at this for now for, for seven years. It's been a long time in the making, so we've seen this train coming down the track for some while. It's the second most lobbied piece of legislation in EU, in EU history, and it has put the chills up a number of sectors. Um, online, big data, financial services, life sciences, to name but a few. The key point, I think, for practical purposes, is that one on the far right of the slide, 25th of May 2018, that's D-Day, as we would call it, for the GDPR. That's when this whole thing comes into force. So the law has been passed, we know what it says, we can read it, we can start to think about what regulation and compliance will look like. It actually comes into force in May 2018. Let's talk a little bit, if we may, around this international region and, and go straight into territorial scope. There's been an awful lot of talk about the long-arm jurisdiction of the GDPR. Those of you from the U.S. will be familiar with that concept. But actually, when we're talking about employee data, we can keep this relatively simple. Where there are people on the ground in a European country, you are always, because you're employing them, you need to know who they are, you need to pay them, you need their bank account details, you'll, they'll be logging into your, your infrastructure. 
you'll have personal data about them. You will always have some kind of entity, even if it's the branch of a US company, for instance, there will be some kind of local entity in almost every case, regardless of the size of that workforce. And that local entity is definitely established within the EU, and is definitely in the crosshairs of the GDPR. Many of our clients, though, are not actually European headquarters. They're headquartered in European, in, in uh, the US or in North America or elsewhere. Where data is transferred to those guys, then they are also called. Now, practical enforcement against a company outside Europe is a moot point that people are discussing. But, you know, because that local entity is also within the jurisdiction, we know that we need to worry about these rules and we need to be, we need to be sensibly ready for them. The, the one-stop shop is, is, I think, worth touching on quickly. In early drafts of the GDPR, we got quite excited by this concept because the carrot was dangled in front of business that said, where you have your main European presence in one EU country, that's the national regulator for data protection that you need to worry about, and you don't need to worry about all the others. Contrasted with the present position where it says, People on, you've got a workforce in the UK, Netherlands, France, and Germany. You actually ask, answer to each of those national regulators for how you treat that employee data. And as we were saying before, the differences in the expectations of those regulators make practical compliance quite challenging. Unfortunately, the final draft of the GDPR has cut away at this concept of the one-stop shop to such an extent that for HR data, it, it's actually become meaningless. So a key takeaway on that would be um, that local, local rules around what you can do with employee data can apply alongside and even overriding the GDPR. So practical example, um, Germany and France, to name two countries, uh, employees where the organization locally is over a certain size have a right to create a work council. And where you introduce new ways of, say, monitoring employee activity or processing their information, you need to consult with, or often in the case of Germany, get the approval of the work council. That's not in the GDPR, but that element of local German and French law will survive the GDPR. So those of you who are familiar with that challenge, you're still going to be talking to your local work councils, I'm afraid, even after the GDPR comes in. And with those in introductory remarks, um, I'll pass over to Michelle to talk about um, Privacy Shield. Great. Thanks, Chris. So we're going to take a step back here, and I know all of the people here on the call who are based in the U.S. said, wait a second, there's a lot of things that are going on. We had, uh, originally we had Safe Harbor, and now we have Privacy Shield, and then we have GDPR, and how do all of these things kind of tie together to create a program, a corporate program, that will keep our employees and our companies safe. So we're going to kind of walk down through here, what is Privacy Shield, how has kind of privacy changed, what, does, what are the key components of that GDPR, what are standard contractual clauses, and what are data transfer agreements, because all of these words kind of come together and programs come together to create an internal corporate privacy program. So let's first start talking about the Privacy Shield framework. So people go, okay, what, what exactly is Privacy Shield? It is the replacement for Safe Harbor. So many of you who have been transferring data for quite a while are pretty much familiar with Safe Harbor and thought, okay, great, I have Safe Harbor. This is wonderful. I can move data back and forth. It's pretty easy to sign up. Some of you who've been around a while probably remember when it was free. Um, then they start charging $200 for it. It was pretty easy to tie in, and it was really a self-certification process. And then what happened is the EU struck down Safe Harbor and said, really, honestly, it doesn't have enough teeth in it. And, and they're probably right, because it was built and, and created back in the 90s, and let's just say the world has changed. So really, this is a replacement of Safe Harbor. So for those of you who may not have been familiar with Safe Harbor, it was monitoring the exchange of data between the EU and the US and had some core components, some that are really basic. Um, they were notice, choice, onward transfer, security, data integrity, access, and enforcement. 
And so those are the basic tenets of safe harbor. Privacy Shield still has all of those basic tenets, but it has some additional ones on top of it. So we're going to talk a little bit about company obligations. The enforcement process has changed, and the whole thing that led to the, the uh, pullback from Safe Harbor and the push forward of Privacy Shield actually is government access. And then there's a, a monitoring component, which we didn't have with Safe Harbor before. So we're going to talk about that here on, you know, um, we're going to talk about the difference from Safe Harbor. So when we talk about tighter corporate regulations, what does that really mean? What that means is, hey guys, you need a privacy policy. Not only do you need a privacy policy, but you need to adhere to it. So you can't just put together this nice little privacy policy, dump it online and say, hey, I did it, I checked the box, I can self-certify. But you're also going to have to ensure that you're really following those tenants in case you get audited. You've got to prove it. So one of the pieces of those that's kind of significantly different is you have to look at, for example, your onward transfer to processors. And you got to evaluate your providers and make sure that they are ensuring your data is protected and complying with the tenets of not only a privacy shield, but as we get forward here into GDPR. So that's just one example of it. Another component of this is redress is now directly with the company that has um, privacy shield certification. So in the old days, under Safe Harbor, companies really didn't worry about it because if someone had a complaint, they had to go to you know, an EU governing body to complain. Well, that's pretty hard, right, to finally get back to the company. But now the companies actually have to manage the complaints directly inside of their organization. This is a big change. Another big change is the limitation on government access to private information. So many of you may not realize, but back in the day, you know, some of the major corporations like a uh, Google or a Microsoft would get thousands of requests from the U.S. government to ask for additional information on particular people. So this is limiting that government access to that private information on servers that corporations own in our community. Also, another component of this is reviewing the policy annually. So kind of safe harbor was put out there a long time ago, and they really didn't update it too often. Now they have a monitoring mechanism with the U.S. government bodies and the European government bodies to sit down and say, okay, let's look at it. How is this, how is this program working? Do we need to update it from time to time? So um, the, the interesting part about this is when you look at where we've come from, now we want to look at how it's a new policy for the U.S. and Europe. So what do you need to do as a company? You need to self-certify annually and that you meet the requirements. Now these requirements may change, right? Because we're talking about having a program that's monitored by both government bodies to ensure that it's working well. You need to display your privacy policy and also live up to that policy. And that's how it's going to flow down into here into GDP. But you also have to reply, reply promptly to any complaints. So you can't just kind of say, yeah, I understand, or go to this government body or not. It's you have to promptly say, yes, I understand the complaint. In our case, for the people on the phone call, be from most likely from employees and address that complaint. And then you have to cooperate in case the, the um, European Data Protection Authorities come in and say, hey, I want to review your program. I want to understand this complaint you have agreed to go ahead and comply with those authorities. So how does that work when we're looking at the EU directive and the new GDPR? So a lot of people are, are kind of confused, especially on, on the U.S. side, saying, well, how is it different than what we had before? So again, just like Safe Harbor moving into Privacy Shield, the basic tenets are still there. So you still have to follow you know, notice and purpose and consent, security, disclosure, access and accountability. That was the original intent. But just remember, right, back when this was written, we didn't have email or just barely had email. We certainly didn't have all the online uh, access that we have today and the data flowing back and forth and pretty much all over the globe. So what you'll see under the new GDPR is components of this, for example, um, please go back up. A slide? Okay, 
part of this is when you look at, under the GDPR, the lawfulness, fairness, and transpa uh, transparency principle is basically you're pulling data what you need for the purpose in which it was required. So you're also looking at the second one and saying, hey, I'm only going to limit it to the purpose in which I need it. Now, this can be, like, for example, if you're picking up an address for an employee, you're only going to use it for corporate mailings or for putting on a pay slip or something to that extent. You're certainly not providing this out to a third party to use to send mail. People do still send mail. <laughs> not many, but people do. The next component here is data minimization principles. This is actually going to give some people some angst especially when you're looking at global HR systems. Because you might say, hey, I want to capture how many children everybody has, you know, people have, and that's a, a common question I'm going to ask across all my populations worldwide. Well, if it's not required in a particular country, especially a European country, you've got to comply with data minimization principles. You don't need it to process the person's payroll or for other legitimate purposes, you shouldn't be collecting it. So you have to really look at your data standardization. Of course, most of us do that on a global basis and say, do I have a concrete purpose for every piece of information that I'm asking for to legitimately use it to either performance manage an employee, to process their payroll, to you know continue with their benefits, et cetera, or is it just something I, I would like to have globally? So that's one piece that is going to need to be reviewed. Accuracy principle. It's important that data must be kept up to date. Now, it's kind of obvious in our world because you don't get paid if you don't have the proper data, but of course, if you're looking at other components of data being captured, this might be more difficult. Storage limitation. Now, most people think, well, this is no big deal. Obviously, I'm carrying data about an employee um, because I need it to actually process a payroll or manage their benefits. But this also relates to, for example, um, a resume. So if someone is applying to a position in your company, how long do you keep those resumes? You know, so you have to have a privacy process around saying, we are only going to keep resumes one month after we fill a position, for example. And that's just an example. But you're saying we're doing that because what happens if the person doesn't show up for their first day of work? So you have to look at every one of your processes and say, hey, how long do we keep this data? Why are we keeping this data? And does it actually, will it be acceptable under GDPR? And so also the next component here is integrity and com uh, confidentiality principles. This is kind of where Privacy Shield fits in. So if you're under Privacy Shield, Privacy Shield is going to force you as part of a process to look at yourself and self-certify, create a privacy program, determine is your data safe, is it encrypted, do you have all the components around ensuring that that data is secure? And if you are a, have Privacy Shield, you're going to be that much closer to complying with GDPR, especially under this integrity and confidentiality principle. And of course, accountability. You have to be accountable to be compliant with GDPR. So kind of looking, moving forward and looking at um, the, what, what has changed? What are the improvements with GDPR? And kind of what are the new challenges with GDPR? So the improvements are, as, as Chris has mentioned, some, as Chris has mentioned, there's a greater harmonization of requirements. And then he kind of stepped back and said, but then we've got some local requirements too that we have to be concerned with. But many of the core concepts are the same as the prior program, as the EU directive. Um, there is a greater harmonization of those requirements, which is great. And it is looking at a risk-based uh, approach. So kind of saying where is the risk in the, in, in, in the process for the data that we're handling and who's handling it. But there are new challenges, right? And we are going to talk, as Chris mentioned briefly, about the new penalties that are out there. There is increased enforcement power. There are There is a lot more teeth in this particular, um, please back up a slide. Thank you. Um, increased enforcement powers. Um, from the different organizations that are handling the, the whole process, and they actually do have more teeth to enforce penalties. Expanded territorial scope is something that also Chris mentioned, kind of walking through where this does apply and to whom. The next one's a big one, though. So, you know, consent and profiling, really. So a lot of what we talk about in 
uh, HR and HCM is all this predictive analysis, and you can use your HR data to determine performers and training and things like that. You're going to have to be really careful with that when it comes to EU data and how you use that data because employ employees, data subjects, can opt out. Additionally, under consent, it needs to be very clear and unambiguous. Um, it has to be for a specific purpose. Now, for many of us on the phone, we know that we absolutely have to have your bank account if we're going to put money in that bank account for payroll. So that's pretty straightforward. And many of the things related to kind of benefits of HR and payroll make a lot of sense. But you have to ensure that the employee knows that that's exactly what you're using it for and not for other purposes. The next one is the big one, which is data protection by design and default. Okay, it, and, and this is one that we get challenged a lot as a global payroll provider is tell me about your program and how you've, you've actually designed it to have privacy in mind at every step. And that's not just in your technology, it is also in how you manage the data and who gets to see that data at what step. So when you sit back and you think about, well, tell me, kind of give me an example of, of what you mean. A lot of companies will provide a pay register, for example, to accounting to post the GL. Well, you can't do that. Does an accountant really need to know that, you know, Bob Smith has this, these details on his paycheck? No, they don't need that. And when you actually look down and say, who needs access to what data? Maybe an HR person only needs access to the performance component of the data, the base compensation, but they certainly don't need access to a bank account unless they're actually processing payroll and have to see that's insurance correct for payroll. So you have to look through all of your HR systems to determine, yes, this is required, for example, and roles and what their roles can be, but also in the process. So you might be pushing paper at different pieces of the process. And do you have privacy inherently in the design? And would it hold up under audit? So that's the other component of that. Um, data protection, you have to have a compliance program. You have to audit against that compliance program and improve that you actually have that in place when if you ever get audited um, to prove that you have uh, all the pieces lined up. Now, you'll also have a data protection officer definitely required, especially for people who are systematic, systematically monitoring data subjects on a large scale. Well, guess what? We're in HR, right? So we are automatically going to have very sensitive data in a large scale. And I know Chris is going to go through a little bit more in detail about DPOs. The interesting one here is the new obligations of controllers and processors. So before the old, under the old data privacy, it was really about controllers. And now, under GDPR, they're pulling in processors. So a controller, if you want to think about it pretty simply, is the company. A processor would be your vendor or partner who's maybe processing benefits or processing payroll or helping you manage recruiting. So all of those people are processors. And you as a controller need to ensure that your processors are following GDPR and all the different principles and processes that go along with that. So they need to have, for example, encryption and privacy by design and data security and confirm their data access. And they need to be regularly testing their protocols just like you need to do it as a controller. So that's really important. The next one is the one that we're going to find is very tricky. So this is the right to access, rectify, and erase, restrict, data portability, all these components. It's a little, it's a little bit of agony for the rest of all the people on the phone because here's why. Employee leaves the company and they come back and say, I want you to forget. Now this is an easier concept if it's um, a person going to Google and saying erase my Gmail email account, right? It's much more difficult if an employee comes back after two years and says, I want you to erase my data and we, as corporations, are required to keep our data maybe for 10 years for a payroll audit, which could be handled by the local government. So now there's going to be a balance, right? How do you raise as much data as you can for the employee at their request to comply with GDPR? And you also have to 
comply with local regulation and tax authorities to be able to prove that you've actually had, you know, yes, I need to keep this information in case I get audited by a local tax authority. So this is where there's a lot of discussion about what do you keep, what do you not keep, what does your privacy program state, and how do you state that under all the different components like consent, et cetera, as you move forward. So there's a lot of discussion around this. Data portability, can you actually export your employees' records and so that they can have it and take it with them? So those are the kinds of things you need to think about inside of your own, own HDM or your own uh, process that you're wor as you're working with this data. There is strict data breach notification rules, 72 hours. And you can imagine as we in the US have seen, there's been these data breaches we find out what months later, that's not gonna happen. Under GDPR, you have to have this, you know, you have to be able to notify, if you're a processor, you have to be able to notify the um, controller, and then the controller has to notify the appropriate authorities within 72 hours. That's very, very fast. And then the last component here is right to claim compensation. So your employees, if they feel that they aren't being managed appropriately or their data isn't being managed appropriately under GDPR, does they do have the right to complain with the supervisory authorities and lodge a complaint against the company, whether it's material or immaterial, due to any kind of GDPR infringement. This is new. This is definitely a new component. So what are standard contractual clauses and how do they um, how do they move into here? We're going to have the next slide. There's our penalties, which Chris has always already mentioned. So let's talk about standard contractual clauses. What are they? So the interesting part is we talk about data exporters and data importers. So think about a data exporter as being a corporation and a data importer as being like a payroll processor or a benefits processor. So these are people who um, you need to have a clause saying, how are we going to send data from one organization to another in a compliant manner, all right? So what they do is it's a model contract. It, it's non-negotiable. It, you set it up between the client, the company, and the processor, and you have to fill out specific annexes. And there's really an annex A, B, and C. And it's very straightforward in the sense that Annex A says what the company, or which we would call the controller, is going to send to the data importer or processor, and why they need the data and why they're sending it. Annex B is why the vendor needs the information and what information the vendor is going to use. So pretty straightforward, that's your, your processor or your data importer. And Annex C is the IT control related at the vendor on how they're going to manage your data. So it's really quite important to have these. And standard contractual clauses are just yet another component of this whole privacy process. So when you step back and look at what do you need to do, people kind of pyramid it and say, okay, I might have privacy shield, I'm gonna sign up for that. The next step is I'm gonna work through my GDPR, my privacy policy, and then in some cases I'm going to need standard contractual clauses and they'll sign up for those across each one of their locations that's managing EU data. So let's talk about data transfer agreements briefly here. And under data transfer agreements, really what you're doing is you're saying, hey, how compliant locally is this processor for me? And you just basically go through like an IT audit, if you want to think about it that way. So you're going to look at control of premises, you're going to look at systems and development, SDLCs, and how they control their data, what their access is, how they control their input, um, what, do they have proper separation. So it's really kind of like a full IT review. And some of these are, are pretty basic and some of these can get uh, quite complicated. So when you look at GDR, GDPR programs and what we're trying to drive towards in 2018, you can see that every, every business touches EU personal data has a whole bunch of work to do. I think a lot of people that I talk to when I'm out, whether I'm at an APA event or um, out visiting, they'll say, oh, I'll, I'll work on that. That's not due for me. <laughs> and I'm going to pass it back over to Chris for a minute, and he's going to kind of walk you through all the work that needs to be done. And like, yeah, I'll deal with that, you know, sometime here in the future. And what will happen is companies need buy-in and from their management and stakeholders. This is a big deal. You've got to build your privacy program. You 
you've got to go in and make sure that they're auditable, make sure that you have legal compliance, the stakeholders and all the, you know, the budget holders, there's, there's financial impact to this. And you may want to use a balance of internal and external support. So there's going to be some series, there's going to be a series of key areas of focus. You know, you got your data audit, you're going to have your consent, you've got to really look at your consent to see if it works, um, and it's going to uh, make sure that you're, you're safe from an employee standpoint and from an employer standpoint, uh, how you communicate, what your contracts are, what's your governance structure, who's your DPO, all of those kinds of things. So now we're going to, I'm going to move it on to the GDPR essentials and next steps, and I'll pass it over here to Chris. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, so, so working through, let's touch on personal data and, and consent. And, you know, it, it may sound like an obvious point, but the GDPR regulates the collection, use, sharing, and security of personal data. So this concept of personal data is absolutely key. If information isn't personal data, the GDPR doesn't apply. And if it is, then the GDPR does with some pretty significant consequences, as Michelle has been outlining. One really important point to note, I think, is that I sometimes hear from North American clients an assumption that personal data under the EU legislation is pretty much the same thing as PII in the US. And it is not. That's a, that's a myth, I think. And the key thing to understand is, as a better rule of thumb than talking about PII and identifiability, if you've got a set of data which is unique to an individual, even if you can't trace it back to a name, an address, or a social security number, any of those classic US PII elements, but say you have, you, you store it against a random unique ID, as many clients do, that would still be personal data. So I think you're going to throw that net a little bit wider than you may think under, um, under US principles in order to do that data audit that we'll talk about more in a minute, more in a minute properly. Give you a specific example. We've had a number of clients recently doing these GDPR audits where some of them monitoring event or reactivity on work systems, whether it's enforcing you know, security policies, internet use policies, and so on. Sometimes, as a privacy enhancing step, they obfuscate the name and they just give, you know, the, the unique um, number of the device or some unique generated, uh, randomly generated user ID so that a more junior person in the IT team may spot that there's an issue, but you don't want them knowing who it was. You may have been looking at something appropriate or perhaps accessing a dangerous website, for instance, that data minimization um, uh, issue that Michelle talked about, that information, even against the anonymous ID, is clearly personal data under the GDPR, and that's an important thing, I think, to remember. We talked about consent. I think, I think a key thing to, to understand what needs to happen in the GDPR project is you need to take a step back once you've once you've got that full picture of the data coming into the business, and ask yourself a question you never need to ask in the US, or rarely, I think, and that is, what is my lawful justification for having this data in the first place? Now, that may sound blindingly obvious. They're my employees. I need to know who they are. So I can tell them what to do, and I can pay them. Um, but the GDPR actually makes you go through that process. And when it comes to HR data, there's, there's three potential lawful justification. One is, it's necessary for the purposes of the contract. In other words, you cannot have an entity and you cannot pay them do all the things you need to as an employer unless you have this, deep, this data and you use it in these ways. The second is legitimate interest, and that might be things like you know, doing certain background checks, for instance, if you're in a sensitive industry. Sometimes, for special categories of data, which is things like health and race, trade union membership, you may need to go for that explicit consent that Michelle was talking about. But you do need to walk through that process and document. You need to document the fact that you've decided these categories of data and these ways of using them are, are based on this particular lawful process. So I think, let, let, let's 
do not want to talk about data audit and data mapping because there's an awful lot of there's an awful lot of focus on this, rightly I think, in the marketplace. So very quickly, for you know, for a lot of businesses, if you've got a small or medium-sized European workforce, mapping and audit may may be a highfalutin phrase. Really, all this is about is let's get a really good picture of all the EU personal data on our staff that comes into the business. Let's understand why we have it, how we use it, who we share it with, and where it sits in the world. Without getting that picture, you cannot begin to decide what your priority remediation steps are going to be. In other words, those GDPR elements that you really need to have in place before May 2018. And I say that because a lot of businesses starting now won't have all of this done by May 2018, in my view. In fact, most of it I would guess. I don't think that means they're at risk of getting those terrible fines, but I do think they need to get off, get out of the blocks, as it were, and get cracking on it. So they look like they are moving towards fines in the UK. We don't expect to see massive fines on the 26th of May. What we do expect is that those businesses who are seen to have done nothing and come to the regulator's attention, they really are at risk at some of those, those scary enforcement rights. So there's a number of ways of doing this, this audit mapping stage. For every client, however, however big or small they are, actually the core of it is pretty old school. It's sitting down with a questionnaire and talking to your co-worker about in HR in particular, but also in IT and engineering, maybe in marketing, and say, right, what data comes into this business from Europe? Why do we have that? How long do we keep it for? What's our security step? Asking all those good questions gets you that picture that you really need. The other obvious thing, I guess, is don't underestimate how, how much time it takes. Every client I've spoken to has had some surprises about the complexity of data flows or the number of vendors that they share with. So, so you know, leave enough time for this. I typically think you probably need two or three meetings. Even if you had, you know, only three or four people from the same team, you'd sit down with them probably two or three times just to get that fuller picture. And it's crucial. You, you can't skip this. And you can't assume that you know everything because then you'll, you won't do all the remediation and then you'll put the business at risk. Um, let, let's move on to GDPR contract. Um, not to go into the detail here, but at a high level, one of the key remediation steps for every company, including for your HR data, is to look at your vendor base, just as you do with Privacy Shield, as Michelle was explaining. For GDPR, regardless of where the data sits in the world, you need to look at your vendor base and say, right, which of these guys either hosts or processes or has access to personal data on my European workforce? And it could be you know, a data center like AWS. It could be a cloud-based HR platform. It could be it could be any number, and you know the logo would be there in, as one of those providers too. What the GDPR says is it has a nice long shopping list of very specific things that that processor contract, as we call it, needs to contain. So what we're seeing at the moment in Europe, and, and many of you on the, on the webinar may be seeing this too, is a lot of platforms are proactively pushing out compliance contracts. And a lot of large customers are starting to ask for them already. It is May. It may seem a lot way away. But actually, a lot of larger clients are saying, well, let's get ready now. Let's not leave ourselves with a ton of contracts rehashing to do in April. You know, let's start to, to get those contracts in decent shape now. And I, I think that's probably, that's probably a good idea. And then governance and accountability. I wanted to spend a little bit of time, and I'm, I'm conscious we need we need to wrap up quite quickly in these time for questions. But and, and Michelle gave a great overview of, of governance and accountability. I think it's the area that surprises businesses most, particularly if you have people on the ground under the existing directive in a lighter touch country like Ireland, the UK, Netherlands, etc. Then the notion that you need to go through this seems absolutely bizarre. But some examples. Um, a record of processing activities. The GDPR says you need to have a document that's really ready for the regulator. It's really helpful for them and not for you or your employees. That says 
exactly what the results of the audit were. So it says this is the personal data that comes in, this is why we have it, this is, these are our lawful bases, these are who we share it with, this is where it goes in the world. It's that snapshot so the regulator knows what's going on. Michelle touched on data protection by design and default. I won't, I won't talk about that. She talked about the data protection impact assessment. And we have some guidance, one of the rare bits of guidance from the EU regulators at the GDPR focuses very much on that next generation of IT monitoring, where whether it's, you know, bring your own device or remote access or things like deep packet inspection that really look at the content of communications that employees are involved with, even though that's automated, it's done by some of the machine learning and AI platforms often in the, in the cyber space. The European regulators have got the bit between their teeth. They think that kind of monitoring actually needs a separate process as part of GDPR where you assess what you're doing and test it against the GDPR principles. So have you minimized data? Do you really need to do all of this monitoring? If you need to do it, do you really need to look at all this data? And it's a document you have ready in a GDPR pack in case the regulator comes knocking where you go through that process and of course come to the, the happy conclusion that it's all, that it's all fine. So there you go. How much of this bit, governance and accountability, you're going to do in Europe will be dictated by two main factors. So don't worry that everyone is going to have, you know, it's going to have three governance to put in place. It'll be governed by what you've got already on privacy shield, um, the kinds of data that you're collecting and the size of your European workforce. And, and that was really going to be my, my, last, my last point. We, we touched on, on data protection options. And I won't repeat what Michelle said earlier, but I think the, the core thing I wanted to get across is this, this is a large and complex piece of legislation that no one with people on the ground in Europe can afford to ignore. But what you actually need to do as a practical matter will be very different if you've got you know, 10 people on the ground in the UK and two in Germany, as opposed to hundreds or even thousands of employees dotted around all over all over Europe. So there is, once you've done that audit and you have that comprehensive picture, one of the key steps is to look at that and say, right, we need to live in the real world here. You know, we're not a global bank, for instance, or a, or a massive healthcare company. What's the art of the possible? What's the degree of compliance that makes sense for me and my organization that is not over-engineering and spending too much time and money on? but which also keeps me there with the pack of the other companies of similar size doing a similar thing with the data. You know, what's that kind of middle of the road compliance that isn't perfect, but if you like, is good enough to manage risk out there in the real world. And actually, I, I think I was, going to, I was going to stop there actually to give time for you guys to, to, ask, to ask questions. Um. Okay, great. So thank you, Chris and Michelle. Um, this, I'm sure, has been incredibly informative for a lot of um, our attendees today. And um, at this point, we will go ahead and open up the Q&A portion of the presentation. Um, I've received some questions, so we'll start with those. Um, and this is probably um, for you, Chris. Um, basically, the question is, um, how does the GDPR impact due diligence during an acquisition process? That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think if we look at it buy side and sell side quickly, I think if you're buying a company um, which has, you know, European presence, you have employees on the ground, perhaps consumer data coming on as well, then I think the key thing to ask at, at this stage is, it is not, it's not to say, have you done all of these 25 things under the GDPR? It, it's to get some comfort and some visibility that the target is actually on this, that they have a GDPR project, um, that they can send you details of, they can summarize the remediation steps that they think are necessary, and, and show you a timeline to move towards, to move towards compliance. I, I, I think it's a great question because as we said, you know, May, I know the temptation, we're all like this, I'm like this with DIY at home. You just put it off and put it off. And it's been, for some companies, it's in the too difficult box. But the reality is if you went in there 
and bought a, a company in Europe which had done nothing at all, not even started to put a team together, then I think that would be a red flag at the very least that when you get your, as the buyer, when you get your feet under the table, you're really going to have to put some, um, uh, put some energy into that GDPR process and we'll have an awful lot of work, an awful lot of work to do. I think, you know, sell side, if you're a potential target and you've got a significant European presence, I, you've got to be ready for buyers starting to ask these questions. You know, when we draft the due diligence questionnaires for our buying clients and when we see them for our selling clients, it's not just the directive anymore. Even though the GDPR isn't here, people want to know that you're you're, you're at least in you know in the process and moving towards a sensible level of compliance. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, someone's asking. They just started a business in Germany and they've only hired three people. Do they need to be compliant with GDPR? Well, <laughs> that's a great question. Well, the good news is that three people, you don't need a work council, so that's helpful. I, you know, that, that's exactly one of those examples where you think, three people, am I really going to go through all this trouble? I, I, I do think there's a light version of GDPR that's appropriate even in a case like that. And I guess the minimum for me that you should be doing, and of course, you know, I've got to caveat this as an attorney, but I don't know the details of the data you have and the processing you do. But as a general point, I think what I would say is you do need to look carefully at the way your, perhaps your US handbook or any internet or any employment documentation communicate how you deal with employee data. Um, you, need to look at, you need to look at that and get a light touch element of localization. I would probably have I'm not German qualified, we have colleagues there. I would probably get a German lawyer on the call and just ask about that and say, this is what I'm doing. These are my growth plans for Germany. You know, what's sensible to do now? At, at the very least, not so much from a privacy perspective, your, your employment contract documentation should step through German legal requirements. They're not an element of localization. They're not actually that complex. But I think unless you have plans to grow really substantially from there in Europe. You know, I wouldn't be suggesting to you that, oh, you need to have a data protection officer, you need to do all of those governance steps. I do a quite light touch, get a high level understanding of what happens with the data, chat through the sensible German lawyer who understands the privacy in the employment context, and just get a sense for what feels right and is, you know, relatively light touch, I think, for, for that size of presence. Perfect. Thank you. I think before before you jump on there, I think what the real important component of that is is to make sure that you have that Somebody very that clearly in the consent. So your German lawyer hands. will be able to help you with that. So I the employee understands they're working so for a smaller company, company, you know, globally, and this is what we'll be able to do for you. And that's not just Germany. That would be any country um, in Europe or even worldwide when you're dealing with privacy. Those Thank employment you. lawyers are really important. And thinking about it, Michelle, you've just triggered my mind. The, the other thing you would definitely do, I think, is put more clauses in place between your German GmbH or your German branch and your US head office. Even for three people, I would actually put that intergroup model clauses in place to, to legitimize the transfer of German employee data to the US. I think if that didn't happen, you know, you could, one of those guys, if they didn't turn out to be the right people for the organization, they could go to a German regulator, and a German regulator would dispose of all your data practices. It's, it's not something you ever want to experience. Great. Um, so this one is around um, electronically transmitting of data. So the question is, um, are there any new restrictions around where data can electronically be stored? So for an example, can HR data be stored in Belgium and then transmitted to a Manila service center to process the payroll for countries in the EU? Michelle, shall I go on that or would you? Yeah, you, you, you can start on that one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we both probably have separate opinions. Go ahead, Trevor. So I, I, think, I think the answer is the GDPR changes nothing but the size of the fine if you get it badly wrong. <laughs> 
It doesn't change the broad principle. So for that, and you know, Manila and the Philippines is, is very popular actually for outsourcing providers. You know, they're they're good, tech savvy, professional, but they are not in what the Europeans think is an adequate country from a critical perspective. So that transfer from the Belgian server to the Manila server, or even for that matter, if the people in Manila have purely on-screen access, so they're not storing a local copy, they're just looking at it, processing data in some way online. Technically, that's still a transfer outside of Europe. So the, 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 the likely, the most common way of getting compliance there is you need a GDPR-ready process a contract with the Manila provider, quite regardless of the data transfer issues, they are a processor for you. And then second, I think you'd probably go for model clauses. You have model clauses between whoever the employer of the employee whose data is being transferred to Manila is. And if there's five of them, because you've got five European entities and there are people in Manila can see all that data, then fine. It can be a single set of model clauses that those five entities signed as controller, and then signed as the data um, importer outside of Europe by that Miller entity. So those would be the must-have. What we need to ask that you should do when appointing a processor is also do some due diligence on what their security steps are, um, asking them, you know, does, does the, the supply chain stop with them, or do they actually? transfer to someone else? Do they have a called a sub-processor sitting behind them? Maybe it's a data center. Maybe it's a support provider that helps them with their IT infrastructure. And, you know, you need to be sensible and pragmatic, but actually, you know, the GDPR does, I, I would want to have a paper trail that's asking those kinds of questions. So you at least can show that you had them in mind when you were appointed, when you were appointed. Um, depending on the data they take, if they're taking employee bank account details, then I think you really want your security team all over the kind of steps that, that they, um, that the Manila people take and really be seen in the audit trails who are taking that, who are taking that seriously. Great. Thank you, Chris. All right, Michelle, I think this is a shout out for you. Um, how is Solergo going to handle this for their clients? Um, kind of explain how the process works and Solergo's responsibility to the client. So we, as, as Solergo, um, you know, we're actually working with Taylor Wessing and in, in, in going through our own GDPR program because um, there's still two components, right? We have to work hand in hand with our clients um, to ensure that we are obviously, we have a privacy program, we're following and doing all the things that Chris has outlined here today to ensure we understand our flow of our information in, in how we handle particular anything from contracts to data to access uh, to data security, encryption, all of those kinds of things are components of our internal IT security and privacy program. So then we've taken those and kind of lined them up. Um, Taylor Weston is actually helping us look through that to ensure on that we will be compliant. Uh, by 20, May 2018. In addition to that, we actually have clients who come in and visit us and spend sometimes, in some cases, several days. Uh, Chicago is going to be lovely in November. You guys are all welcome to come up in, in November, December, January. And, and we actually walk them through. Here is our protocol. Here is how we're handling the data. And work with them so they can determine, okay, do I want to keep my data? My data with my HCM is in the U.S. Okay, do you want to use our U.S. You know, server base or do you want to use our European server base? So it's, it's a, a, an actual process where we work with each client. Some clients we have privacy shields, some clients we have standard contractual clauses, some clients have, you know, more, they've actually come on site and done, as Chris they just mentioned, a very cool uh, privacy impact assessment. Um, others kind of come to us and say, hey, what do you need us to do? So this is kind of even the first step, is having these webinars just to get that knowledge out there to say, hey, you need to start now. We need to start looking at how you're looking at your program. As Chris has said, how many employees do you have outside or in, I should say not outside the US, but in Europe? What is the impact to your organization related to that? 
And then how does that dovetail down into your processors? Because we're probably not the only one. We're payroll, but I'm sure you have benefits. You may have a recruiting office. Um, you have, certainly have an HCM, you know, and all of those components. So we're just one piece of it. So today is our first step to try to bring some of that knowledge out to our um, clients and obviously to the greater industry as a whole. But if anybody has any questions related specifically to us at Solergo, you know, feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to talk to you individually uh, about your program. Um, I know we're going a little bit over um, and we're going to have probably one more question. We've gotten a lot of questions. So um, at the, on the screen, um, if you have questions, um, there is a contact person, Reha. Um, you can send any additional questions to her and we will make sure that they get sent to Chris and uh, Michelle and all of your questions will be answered. Um, so I'm gonna end with this last one. Um, there is a question re uh, regarding, can you describe the self-certification process? I'm assuming this is for Privacy Shield. Okay, the best way to do the self-certification process is actually go to the Privacy Shield website and it'll actually walk you through. It's not too complicated on how to sign up and it's not too complicated on what they ask you for. The complexity around it is adhering to it. So you are going to be required to put together a privacy program. So you can make that very simple. Um, or you should, if you're really looking at it in, re, in, in relation to GDPR, you should look at it and say, no, we really need a pretty intense program because we have, for example, you know, multiple countries in Europe that we're covering. So what you need to do is look at that as just one component of the whole privacy program. So I would suggest just go to the privacy, you type in US Privacy Shield, um, it'll take you to the website, it'll actually walk you through the steps. Again, the self-certifying is not hard. It's making sure though, that you have all of those pieces are robust enough to need an audit. So that's the, that's the important part of it. Great, and um, Chris, I'm gonna throw this last one at you. Um, how will Brexit affect the implementation of the and that's a great question. I mean, for Brits like me, you, we avoid talking about Brexit. It's like having that lunatic relative in the attic. You have to pretend no one can hear. Um, but but it's, a, it's a great question in all in all seriousness. I think for for UK-based companies and for global companies with a UK presence, the right approach is actually just to say GDPR is coming. The UK government and the UK regulator, the ICO, have both said. GDPR is coming. We are a member of the European Union at least until March 2019, and therefore we'll have 10 months of it at the very least. And, and they've stated they will take those responsibilities very seriously. Beyond that, the general consensus is, and I, I agree with it, that actually we talked about you know, privacy shields and model causes. Those kind of issues crop up for countries like the US that have a very different approach to privacy. Um, there are other countries that are whitelisted, as we call it, Canada, Argentina, Israel, there's a few others in the world. And they can allow European data to flow freely from those countries to the European Union and then back again. Now the UK, when we definitively leave, whenever that is, will want to very, we want to work really hard because we're so integrated, you know, from a data perspective with the rest of Europe. We will want to be on that white list. Being on that white list will mean the UK, I think, having something very similar to the GDPR. And in fact, the government has published a bill called the Data Protection Bill, which even before the GDPR comes in, is intended to push UK law much closer to GDPR standards. My last point on that, I know we're running out of time, is I don't know if it's relevant to the questioner or not, is when your US company, and sometimes when US companies look at this data transfer issue, they think, why don't I just take that off the table and host in Europe? It's often not quite as difficult as that, as easy as that, rather. But when you are seriously looking at doing business in a number of European countries, and you do want to look into having a European data center to host your EU data, mm -hmm. I think the sensible thing is probably not to put it in the UK, simply because of the uncertainty, but to put it, you know, Dublin and Netherlands are two of the most popular choices. Some people put it in Germany because they think that's the most, that's the best sales message about the quality of their compliance. 
But if you're looking at that, you don't need to, but if you were looking at that, I'd probably avoid the UK simply because of those uncertainties around, around Brexit. Great, thanks, Chris. Okay, well, we've gone over, so this concludes our webinar for today. We'd like to thank everyone for attending. Um, additionally, we would welcome your feedback, so we'll be sending a brief survey. If you'd have a moment to complete that, it would be appreciated. And lastly, I just want to note that we will be hosting and repeating this webinar on December 7th. So if you would like to attend or you have colleagues or others that you know would like to attend, please let us know and we will make sure to get them the invitation. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Are we out? Close. We're closed? Okay, I have to. Good job, ladies. Oh, such an improvement over the last one. <laughs> I can't. Uh, All right, so why don't you have 115? No, we had more than that. We had 161 at one point. No. We had 100. We had 161 at the height. Oh, let me, but I'm, I'm spread out all over the place. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, you're fine. I'm just going to. And we don't know. And we don't know how many people were sitting in there together. We don't know that. Because we had multiple couples. But 161 called in. 161 called in? Yeah, wait, Michelle's calling in. Hello? Awesome, you rocked it. You did a Girl. great job, Michelle. Woo. We are not letting Kathy do the most of the I know. <laughs> well, we kept on getting distracted. We, we kept on getting distracted. Tim came in here. Yeah. I just keep talking like she just moved the truck. I think we got some, I didn't even have to go to our canned questions. Um, we okay. were really, we had some really good questions. Yeah. Um, about awesome. uh, that was yeah. Well, the way that he was going, I'm like, this is going to be over at 1030. Yeah. That's right. Is it going to be a Nina's room? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That was hilarious. Well, that was like, oh, he's 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 like, oh, then one other question was, can you give us a list of uh, websites that we can go to? I was like, I'm not asking that. Like, I wanted to ask something that was substantive. Yeah, yeah. And, well, and then you got the other one. So, whatever you just have one stop. Yes, yeah, risk. risk. Yes, yeah. it does. Also, I want to, I actually looked on it, like the page numbers, there's two page numbers on each of the corner. Why don't that oh, just I print it that way? Uh oh, it's on here. Oh, really? Okay. So yeah, we need to change that typo, and then um, we'll look at the pagination as well. There's a problem. I noted it. I, I saw it. I have to go back in. I'll go back in. That I have to change the master. I, I can do that, Michelle. And there's risk is spelled wrong. Uh, risk. Yeah, risk is the one that's on the page. Yeah. Okay. So I would, but then you would send it as a PDF. So yeah. No, you have to send it as a PDF. Okay. 
block it. Yep, it does. It totally does. Okay, cool. Anything else? No, I think you thank you guys for organizing it. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sunny here. Great, yeah, great presentation went off. Okay, well, get some rest. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Um, we have, we'll start with the questions, I'm sure. Yeah. And then we're going to make questions about the deck. So, um, Linda's going to PDF the deck? Yeah. I'll PDF it. I have to go in and change the master. We have to clean up that other animation and it has to go under too slight or something because... It will... Well, it's a PDF. Kathy, we have to uh, do the, the questions for the survey too, at least you know, Some other um, activities, some other payout signifiers. Hmm. And there's two slides that don't have, it's not on our template either. Oh. That was fun, ladies. Great job, everybody. I guess can we just cut it short because uh, he, he has not time. He missed the last two. Did he do this on purpose? Like, I don't, I, that's what he called this out. Why does it say T and then some of them say K? Yeah, I saw that. That, I have a feeling. It says yes. the, I'm not sure. Yeah, I saw the, the K's on there. It's on the printed copy, too. Thanks, everyone. But look at here's like the, the yeah, it's got a K on it. And here's a 26. And you know what K. they did? It's it, yeah. I have to go in and individually remove those, uh, which I will do. But the form should go on our template. That is on our template. Oh, it's um, not. Which one is that? I'm sorry, Kathy. There's, there's I'll go through. I have to clean them up now that Michelle's done them. There's a there's a few things I've noticed. So should we just go through this real quick to make sure that you have all of the things that I caught? Uh, yeah, uh, but the, we we have. Yeah, go ahead. We'll wait, wait for Will. When we do the PDF, we'll have to wait for I don't think it'll print out if it won't print out. Okay. Is there ways like look at how come this doesn't um you can't even read this? Our confidentiality two thousand and seventeen at the at the bottom of it? Well that's because it's projecting on that board. It's look at on the it's not on my screen too. Well, that's because it's that's the template. In other words, that's uh, that. I think, I think we have to move it up. Uh, uh, I want to say this other thing is that some of the top left-hand corners are cut off. Like right here, where we are with EU privacy, like it's it's cut off. Like if you take this and move it down a bit, so that it equals out or whatever. See how the whole thing. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll have to go through. I've just got Michelle's. I'll have to go through it and go through everything. And um, That's the footer. Um, uh, that was the way it was designed. I, uh, that's a design thing with the confidentiality. I can't move it. It was hard designed into the template. I can't move it. Um, I might be able to go in and make it darker if you want. Well, that's because maybe when it's on paper, the, you can't read all the color time. Well, that's because it's a footer. It's it's a footer. And when it's created a footer, it's always in shading. Oh, okay. Yeah. Our cryptic likes letter to 2017. You can probably do this in YouTube. I mean, I can, I, I, that's a design thing. I'd have to go back to Andrea and see. I mean, they did that. Calibre did that, to be honest with you. I, I have to go back in. Oh, and how to edit that? Well, it's it's a design element. Yeah, it just, uh, I think what it is on Slide Master, they have it as Apex Book Light, which Apex Book Light I never use because like you basically can't see it. Uh, uh, she's saying you can't. I, yeah, I might be able to go back. So I have to go to the master. So yeah, I have yeah, to go to the master, so Kevin. Like, yeah, master there is a Slide Master. I have the master up right now. Yeah. I have to go in and change it. That, yeah, that's, you have that in PowerPoint. Yeah, I have it. I yeah. Oh, okay. I yeah, I, I have it. I yeah. discovered that recently. That's the only reason why. All right, so. All right. How about you?
you will. All right. Let me send an email to you guys right now. Boy. All right, I changed it in the master to bold. But I can't move it up or down. I can just make it a different font. Oh. I'm gonna have to go through this just slide by slide. Well, you can take mine too, because I have circles for all. Okay, that's it's good. Nice to, uh, Seems to go well, so I'm like, there's good headphones on there. Yeah. Call it we have a total of 223, 151 called in. Yeah, a lot of those are probably just slurred with people up front because they all registered independently. And then there's. No, like, these are people that called in. Oh. We had 250 register. Gotcha. And then 161 people that called in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just so saying a big group of that's probably people. Are That would be one phone call. That would be one person. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm one sorry. phone call. So, yeah, yeah, so I'm saying that gap of like 151 call in, 52 celerical people, total of 223. Oh, okay, one, okay, gotcha. We have 62 registered for celerical, so I'm assuming all of them are. So, that's actually, I mean, you add those two numbers together, that's essentially your total. Yeah. So, that's 223 out of. Those people may have been in the same room as well because yep. there's a lot of, yeah. wow, that's actually really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in terms of perspective. Yeah, so did you send us, Lisa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My stuff in red. Will, so you can Will see. has worked with Flaro for seven years in several different roles within the organization. Will have gained a range of insights into the global payroll environment through work in operations, relationship, and I can go pull down my LinkedIn one. Do you want to give them? Is this the work work number? Or That's my work number. Okay. Although I do have to say, I have my cell number in my email thing, so I don't think I've had like two people. Yeah. Call. The role of the global payroll is with a multi-potential. Give answers that tip to what we do well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> emerging trends. Who shared your thoughts on emerging trends? To say an emerging trend in payroll that is the most surprising to me uh, is the growing drive toward the consolidated management of services being globally centralized through HQ or shifting toward a shared service center model. In terms of trends that tend to be lagging. Yeah, that's what I was. Trends that seem uh, lagging. As far as trends that seem to be lagging, that might be a little bit better way of. Or with 
regarding terms of him saying he lied. Regarding what? Regarding. And then just trends the term of the lease. Can't be right. I'm sorry, Scott, to have you bend the larger trend towards global consolidation of crime and taxation. Maybe you say movement instead of trend. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah, a larger movement towards. Movement? Mm hmm. So is there a reason they ask question of something that you expect would not be part of the application of the title? Oh, so that's where in part the instruction do is kind of like a don't feel obligated to obligated answer, to answer control, every single one of them. Keep it between a kind of a character length range. Um, so I can edit down certain questions on that, but my questions seem to have okay. more than there. Okay. Um, yeah, just sorry, it had it. So it said having a pro standard process for format of reporting, um, standard process and format for reporting. Having a standard process for formatting. Instead of for format, it's and format, standard process and format. I'll go through this all, uh, and this goes to the editor anyway. Clients can. Is it, is it, is the basis a uniform? That's pretty much the same thing. You can probably add one of those. Data sets are standardized. Are standardized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, clients can be someone who can greater degree of formulas than can show cleanliness and accuracy of the information. Well, there's great. In operation, the consistency process down standards. We accomplished through many different sources, including system consolidation, trading systems, and operation process contracts. And it's a fair value to our clients. Yeah, so I wonder if this is, is this going to be too many then? Did he say just answer the ones that you want? Or did he say well, answer like three to five? No, they just said don't feel obligated to answer each one and typical responses are between a certain, like, uh, And they'll give us, they'll give us feedback. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I'm not I can certainly it. comment a lot more of these. I figured I'd comment on well, I think what we'll do is we'll take this and just do the ones that we did and delete all the other questions. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, we have to set it up a little differently anyway, and I wanted to, to just, even though they have editors on their end, I would like to send yeah, it yeah, through. So. I'm going to send it over today to our editor, and she'll take a look at it. Okay. But I'll clean it up first, and then and then take it out. There's just some small things I'll clean up. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's really Don't worry about that. You should, I told you not to worry about it yesterday. I said, don't worry about it. We'll take it from there. I'm not the least bit worried about it. Yes, the content. Give me the, exactly, you know what, that, that, you give me good content, we'll make it happen, Will. Don't worry about it. That's easy for us. Yeah, all of these, when we finish today, are going to go over to Shannon. She'll edit all of them before I send it. Yeah, before I send it over. She's, a, she's our um, editor, so she'll look at everything. Yeah, let me know since there are a lot of extra questions if when we go through the three of ours, if there's any... Unanswered. Area yeah, is that, that, yeah. So, yeah, so what I'm going to do is out. I'm going to look at all, I'm going to edit them, I'm going to look at all of them, and um, and then I'm going to send this document, the document from the three of you, over to Shannon. She'll do the editing. She'll have it back to us tonight or tomorrow. Okay. And um, then what I'll do, 
is I'm going to take a quick look and say, okay, are we missing any pieces? Okay. Gotcha. Because it looked like Nina and Jim had gotten different questions. Different they did, actually. He so. pre-set them up based on your job title. Gotcha. So That's that awesome. was done based, uh, that was done by GPMI. Okay. Is that gotcha. your uh, picture? Do we have a picture? Uh, no, let me get that real quick. Okay. Do they want a high resolution? Did they ask for a high resolution? Yeah, they did say high resolution. So I'll, I'll pull off what I okay. put on post on the YouTube. Um, when people are asking, when are we going to be able to get the recording? Uh, as soon as it's ready, we show, uh, G, uh, go to webinar. We'll let Alicia know it's ready. People are asking, so I want to ask I can't, oh, I can't, as soon, I, I like, thought, I mean, like, like, tomorrow, or? You said the 25th. 25th? You said we would be sending out the recording by the 20th. No, I want to just the date, whatever we decide, because she said what, she needed 48 hours or something like It's when, she has to get a, a flag from, I'll ask her, from a go to meeting, lets her know when it's ready. I can't remember if it's 48 hours. I can't remember what go to meeting does, if it's 48 hours or 24 hours. But don't tell anybody anything, because if there's a problem with the recording, we have to send it to an editor. OK. That's all done by go to meeting. It's not done by us. Okay. 